Good day. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Douglas Harder, and in this topic, we're going to discuss two-dimensional vectors, their definitions and interpretations. So in this topic, we're going to describe two-dimensional vectors. We will discuss the interpretation thereof. Are they points, arrows, both, neither? We'll look at a number of examples and different interpretations. We will emphasize the understanding that it is, most importantly, ordered numeric data. A two-dimensional vector is nothing more than an ordered pair of real numbers. Here are three examples of two-dimensional vectors. Each entry is a real number, be it positive or negative, small or large. If we are using a symbol to represent a vector, we will use a bold letter. Now, in some cases, we may not know what the entries are, or the entries could be arbitrary. For example, we may have an unknown vector which we are attempting to find the values thereof. Or we may be allowing a vector to be any possible real ve two-dimensional vector. In this case, the entries of the vector will be represented by the same letter as the name of the vector. However, it will be an italicized letter with a subscript. So for example, for the bold vector y, the first entry is the italicized y with a subscript 1. The second entry is an italicized y with a subscript 2. Now, it's important to understand that this is ordered information. So therefore, if we swap the entries of a vector, it represents a very different object. So for example, the two-dimensional vector u is equal to 0 0.21, negative 1.68, may be thought of as a point on the plane relative to the zero vector or the origin, where the first entry tells us how far we should move to the right of the origin, and the second entry tells us how far to move up from the origin. However, as the second entry is negative, we are moving down from the origin. You will note that this vector v is equal to negative 1.68. 0.12 is a very different point indeed. This represents the number that tells us first to go to the right, negative 1.68, or 1.68 to the left, and then 0.21 up. So again, for a vector, it is ordered information, and if you switch the order, it represents a complete different object. Now, a vector is not always going to represent a point on the plane. It is simply ordered information. Here we see a nodal analysis of a circuit. We have on the left a voltage source or battery and then we have ground between two resistors. The vector gives us the voltage at the point V sub 1 and the point V sub 2. As a completely different example, a vector could hold your stock investments in your portfolio. For example, if you were holding only two stocks, this vector S may represent how much money you are holding in each of these stocks. For example, you may own three, uh, approximately $3,150 worth of st stock in Ford Motor Company and just over $10,000 in Apple Incorporated. A negative number here could, for example, represent a short sell. Remember that vectors are ordered pairs. If we swap the entries, this vector here is going to represent a very different investment from the vector above. <laughs> 
Now, textbooks and papers often use bold letters to represent vectors. On the blackboard, vectors, at least by this author, are usually drawn as Roman letters with an arrow. Finally, occasionally you may see a vector represented with either, either an overbar or underlining. In any case, pay attention to what the user or the author is using and just accept the notation that is being used. In the course text and these lectures, we are using bold. In the classroom, this author will use an arrow above the letter. Now, there is one special vector we have to introduce, and that is the zero vector, represented either as a bold face zero or a zero with an arrow on top. This vector is the point that is zero in each direction. And just in case you didn't see it, there it is. We may call this either the zero vector or we may sometimes call this the origin, depending on what is appropriate terminology. Now, are vectors arrows? Now, this is a question of interpretation and appropriateness. Consider, for example, the following vector, negative 1.3, 1.8. I could interpret it as simply a point in the plane at that location, or I could interpret it as an arrow extending from the zero vector or the origin. If we are using the arrow notation, the location of the vector is also going to be called the head of the vector, while the origin will be the tail of the vector. Now, to consider this idea of do we use arrows or dots or points, let's consider the fact that you're driving down a straight road. First of all, you must describe your location relative to a known location. You're on the 401. You're 260 kilometers away from your favorite restaurant, the Big Apple. Well, 260 kilometers only tells you how far away it is. That's an absolute number that gives no information of direction. If we need to understand where we are relative to a location, let us assume that the Big Apple is at zero kilometers. I am now 260 kilometers east of that restaurant. I could either represent this as a point 260 kilometers relative east or an arrow going to that location. 100 kilometers west would be represented as negative 120 kilometers east. So again, which interpretation is more reasonable here, an arrow or a point? As a location, I think a point would be more reasonable. Similarly, suppose I'm driving at 110 kilometers per hour. Again, that is an absolute value and therefore does not indicate whether or not I'm moving towards the restaurant or away from the restaurant. To give spatial information, I need a velocity. Am I moving west or east? So in this case, I need to adopt that a positive number is a velocity or moving towards the east. A negative number is going to be moving west. So in this case, my velocity would be represented as negative 110. This is relative to not moving at all or zero kilometers per hour. Again, 
which is more reasonable? Is it a point on the speed or velocity line, or is it an arrow? In this case, because it is movement, some people may consider this to be an arrow. Additionally, we can put two pieces of information together. Assuming the scales are the same, just different units, I could, for example, have my location as the point in red, and then my velocity as a vector indicating the direction I am moving in. Now, similarly, we're going down the highway and we see traffic up ahead, so we take our foot off of the gas pedal. Well, this causes us to decelerate. Assume that we are decelerating at 0 0.5 kilometers per hour per second. Well, we were moving left, so a deceleration moving west is an acceleration east. So since we are always considering east to be positive, this would actually be an acceleration of 0 0.5 kilometers per hour per second east. Now, is acceleration an arrow or a point? Again, it's important to think of it simply as a value. Similarly, a vector is simply ordered information, for example, in the plane. Suppose I'm driving away from home. I'm 212 kilometers away from home. Again, this is an absolute distance, but it does not give a location. Instead, assume I am at this location relative to home. What does relative to home mean? That means that home is the zero vector. And so now I am traveling 81 kilometers west and 196 kilometers north. Now, remember, that's going to be something very different from 196 negative 81, which would represent 196 kilometers east and 81 kilometers south. Relative to my home, close to the Laurel Creek Conservation Area, the first location is Tobermory, whereas the second location is very close to Warsaw, upstate New York. Just for context, here's the origin at Laurel Creek Conservation Area. The location I am traveling to is up here at Tobermory. So suppose I'm now at Tobermory, but now I'm leaving. I'm driving home down Highway 6 at 80 kilometers per hour. This tells me how fast I'm moving, my speed, but it doesn't tell me which direction I am moving. To represent my velocity vector, I do require a vector. In this case, I may be moving 50.34 kilometers per hour east and negative 62.18 kilometers per hour north. So this represents my velocities going both both east and north or in this case, I'm moving generally in the southeast direction. And again, we can add the velocity vector to our current location vector. How again, however, again, the vector of the location represents something very different from the vector of the velocity. And once again, if we swerve to avoid hitting a deer, that acceleration vector is going to be something, again, very different from either the location or the vector. They're independent pieces of information. However, if this is my stock portfolio, if you recall the amount of money I have in shares of Ford, and the amount of money I have in shares of Apple, then perhaps 
I have a deal or an understanding with my stockbroker for every single month to invest a fixed amount of money in each of these companies. In this case, the amount I'm putting into each company each month may be represented by a separate vector. In this case, my change in investment, which is represented by a delta, so now the vector is represented by a symbol delta representing change in the stock of $100 more into Ford and $500 more into Apple. Again, at this point, it makes very little sense to really think of this as a point in the plane or an arrow in the plane. In this case, this is ordered information. The first one is the amount of stock I do contain, and the second is the amount I am increasing my stocks in each of those companies. Thus, a two-dimensional vector may be interpreted as a point in the plane or an arrow in the plane extending from the origin with the tail at the origin and the head of the vector at the point. However, I'm going to encourage you that this may not always be a reasonable interpretation. So please do not always try to think of vectors geometrically as arrows or points in the plane. Later on, we're not going to have two-dimensional vectors. We're going to have 10-dimensional vectors or 100-dimensional vectors and perhaps even infinitely dimensional vectors. And what's going to happen is if you force yourself to concentrate only on this planar representation of two-dimensional vectors, then you're going to be trying to force your mind to visualize a 10-dimensional vector. It's not going to work. Instead, focus primarily on thinking of a two-dimensional vector as an ordered pair of real numbers representing specific numeric information. Now, as a comment, if we are indeed thinking of vectors as points in a plane, then I may refer to the location based on quadrants. So, for example, here the vector u appears in the first quadrant and the vector v appears in the third quadrant. Uh, this is notation that you've probably already seen in secondary school. However, I'm just emphasizing again here, just in case you have not seen this notation, it's just a convenient way to indicate or identify a specific vector in the plane. Now, in secondary school, you may have seen a vector represented as a row, as opposed to the columns that we have been using in these lectures. Please, do get used to writing vectors, at least two-dimensional vectors, as columns. This is going to make your course in linear algebra much easier. So, to summarize, in this topic, we've described two-dimensional vectors. Two-dimensional vectors are nothing more than ordered pairs of real numbers. Now, both numbers must represent similar things. For example, they may represent locations, or velocities, or accelerations, or amount of money in stocks, or voltages. Their significance depends on the interpretation. In some cases, it's convenient to think of them as points in the plane or as arrows. However, do please resist this in general because it's going to make it more difficult when we start looking at abstract vectors. However, from here on in, we are now going to look at operations on two-dimensional vectors. And having seen all these additional operations that we can perform and observe about two-dimensional vectors, we will then move on to look at 
three-dimensional vectors. Here are some references, acknowledgments, the colophon, and a disclaimer. Cheers!